actually works and uh, uh, how this meeting, uh, how this actually works uh, and uh, what's going on. You can think of a simple situation where di is binary, right? So it's either zero or one. So some units are affected by this uh, aggregate shock, others are not. Okay, and so if, if you're in that situation, you can construct these averages. Okay, so you take your outcomes and your um, in the variable of interest, and you aggregate uh, for, uh, for units for diff with different values of di. So you aggregate for di is equals for units with di equal to zero, and you aggregate for units with di equal to one in each time period. So this is a cross-sectional average, right? And so you end up with uh, this uh, uh, time series objects that vary over time and uh, kind of there are for two different groups for di equal to zero and di equal to one and uh, then you can look at this maybe mm, kind of weird but quite simple regression where you say okay i'm going to look at the difference uh in every time period i'm going to uh, look at the difference in these two aggregates both for the outcomes and the uh and the uh endogenous variable right so i'm going to construct this difference and i'm going to run uh, two hours regressions uh, time series now regressions of this difference on on my aggregates uh, aggregates. Okay. So uh, it's very simple to see that if you do this and then you take uh, delta and pi from this uh, regressions and you take the ratio, then you are going to get the two SLS estimate okay, from the previous slide. So in other words, this is just <clears throat> a way to unpack the 2SLS algorithm, right? So what does it do when you when you run this regression uh, estimated by two stage least squares? Well, that's what you do. And uh, uh, similar representation will hold for DI, which is not binary. Uh, in this case, you would aggregate units so the weights that are proportional to something like this demeaned uh, version of DI, and then you will run time series regressions. Okay, so this is a, a representation for what is currently done in practice. Okay, so uh, now kind of if you think about this, then this has two parts, right? This algorithm this has two this has two parts. So uh, you aggregate over i, and then you regress over t. That's what you do, right? And then you take the ratio. And uh, kind of the motivation for this uh, of of both of these steps is, is, is different, right? So aggregation over I, why do we aggregate, right? Why don't we run all of these regressions at individual uh, level? Well, we aggregate uh, because we want to kind of construct this difference. And why do we care about this difference? Because we have this time fixed effects here that we need to eliminate. Okay, so uh, this is again very simple, but uh, people are concerned about those effects in macro or, or in say macro development literature. Those would represent general equilibrium effects, and we want to take them out. And uh, you do that by this aggregation. And then once you have taken them out, you say, okay, well, uh, I I can utilize my arguably exogenous variation in ZT to 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 deal with this. Uh, with, uh, to deal with this, uh, uh, to deal with this problem and estimate the ratio. Okay. And so with TSLS, these are very simple steps, uh, but perhaps they are too simple. Okay. In particular, we're going to focus on the aggregation uh, part in this presentation. So, uh, and the motivation for different aggregation would be that uh, we aggregate to eliminate other other aggregate shocks, right? And so, but this type of aggregation that I was descri describing works only if those shocks affect everybody the same way. Okay. But what if they affect units differently? And why would they affect units differently? Well, because we kind of believe that our aggregate shock of interest, ZT, affects uh, units uh, differently. And so why other things should not be like that? All right. So, uh, and here is like the main uh, idea uh, of, the, of, the, of the paper in uh, just, uh, I guess two slides. Okay, so uh, imagine that your model, and here I'm uh, writing the model for the reduced form, so I'm connecting the outcomes to the instruments, is a, a bit, a tiny bit more complicated than the one that kind of motivates to SLS. So imagine that you have the two-way fixed effect, I think that you always have. You have the uh, this product, the ZT that affects units uh, differentially depending on Z, DI, 
And, but on top of that, you have this uh, additional object, this theta i h t object, where both theta and h are unobserved, right? So this is additional factor structure uh, in your reduced form uh, that uh, is potentially problematic. Why is this problematic? Well, in, let us do the aggregation exercise that we've been doing before, right? Uh, so construct this to averages, subtract, what we're going to get? We're going to get this difference on the left as before. We're going to get some uh, version of this uh, unit fixed effects, right? Kind of uh, aggregated. So this will be the constant. This part will go away, right? Because we're taking the difference. Delta will stay. Di will aggregate to one by construction. So we'll get zt. And then we'll get this difference here, right? So this unobserved aggregate shock that we have, ht will be present after aggregation and we multi multiplied by the difference between uh, two average th two average thetas, right? So theta for the uh, group with where di is equal to one and theta for the average theta for the group where it's equal to zero. And then you'll get uh, the average uh, residues. And so the uh, thing here is that uh, our two SLS will be uh, invalid. One would be invalid. Well, if if this is equal to, if this is not equal to zero, right? And HT is correlated with ZT. In other words, kind of, uh, you need two things for uh, to SLS to fail. Uh, but as I will kind of try to say, this, both of these are I expected in application. What is alpha? Uh, alpha, alpha is the, uh, is the difference between uh, average alpha for the, uh, Units with di equal to zero minus the average out for the uh, for the units with di equal to one or the other way around one minus zero. Okay, so that's that's that difference. All right, uh, so that's that's what you get when you do two SLS. Now, what can you do instead of two SLS? Well, we can say well instead of simple differences and means. That's what we've been doing so far. Let us consider weighted differences, where we weight units within each subgroup differently, right? So we don't say, okay, every uh, just kind of aggregate of our units with di equal to zero and di equal to one in the same way. We're gonna now aggregate differential. So imagine that you construct some kind of weighted average. Okay, so, and then you do the same thing. You uh, construct this weighted average and you subtract so uh, you get a new alpha, of course, right? Because now it's a weighted uh, difference uh, of weighted averages. Uh, time fixed effects go away uh, because this is a weighted averages. You still get delta here and multiplied by one and then zt. And then you get this uh, uh, difference in weighted thetas. And so the hope is that for appropriate weights, uh, and under some assumptions, this uh, theta one uh, tilde is going to be approximately equal to theta zero tilde. And if that happens, then HT is no longer concerned. Right? So that is the goal, right? To try and find the ways that do that, that uh, aggregate our outcomes cross-sectionally in such a way that something like HT is not present anymore. So how can we hope to so that's the, that's the aspiration. So how can we uh, get there, right? So what can we do to, 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 to find these uh, types of weights? Well, to do this, we'll utilize two basic uh, facts uh, about them, right? So first fact is that, mm, uh, first fact is about this, uh, this last part, like this difference in, in errors. And the idea there is that as long as the weights that you're using are sufficiently uh, diffused, right? Uh, um, or in other words, uh, they have a relatively small uh, L2 norm uh, spread out weights. So you aggregate a lot of subjects, right? Then this is gonna be small, right? This thing is gonna be small here uh, because it's gonna be the, this uh, aggregation of the noise and uh, by the something like low or large numbers, it's gonna be small. Uh, so you can kind of say, okay, if my weights are diffused, then this is not a problem. I'm not going to, that's not going to affect things too much. Uh, and then uh, if you look at what's left, so what is the manifestation of theta one tilde being close to theta uh, zero tilde? And the manifestation is that when you're trying to predict this difference uh, by uh, ZT linearly, right? 
the it's going to be easier to predict so you get a better uh, some sort of better mean squared error if uh, if you uh, if you get if this is small okay? so the idea is going to be okay we'll try to find a way such that uh, this prediction uh, is as 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 good as possible okay so that's that's the idea that's what we're going to do and now just as a digression so that it doesn't look uh, like something uh, very uh, foreign. Uh, suppose that uh, we are in a very special situation where ZT is equal to zero for the first uh, T naught periods. Okay, so it's just zero, and then something happens. You can interpret this as kind of like difference and difference type of design. Why? Because kind of uh, first nothing happens, then it happens, and it affects some units but not the others. So you just kind of have this DI that uh, tells you whether the aggregate shock affects certain units or not. So uh, the TSLS uh, weights, what, uh, would, how, what would they do, right, in the presence of this HT? You will look at the, three to, at the uh, periods, the first T-naught periods, and you will see that the pre-trends there are not kind of parallel, right, because they are going to be, there's going to be some alpha, and then there is going to be this aggregate shock that moves. Okay. And uh, so the manifestation of the presence of, of, of this HT will be that you don't have parallel pretrends. Uh, and the idea that, like, well, maybe you can reweight things, okay, uh, uh, so that trends do look parallel. And uh, this is something that uh, we've been exploring uh, in other, our, our research you know, on the synthetic difference and difference. And it turns out you can actually do that. Okay, so here the uh, ideas will be kind of in the same spirit. But uh, ZT is not going to be binary, uh, or kind of it's not going to be zero for the first uh, you know, periods, and the I might not be necessarily binary. All right, so here is an empirical uh, example so that you kind of understand uh, how these things uh, might look in practice. Okay. Uh, and here is an example of two SOS, how two SOS are complex. Uh, so this is uh, Nan and Chen, uh, 2014, and this is a paper that, as I was described before, focuses on the this uh, food aid, right? Uh, the effect of the food aid on conflict, and they use the wheat production in the United States as an instrument, and uh, the regime that uh, they are working in the data is that you, they have like 98 uh, regions. Uh, in, uh, I think they focus on Africa mostly, and, uh, and then they, at which they observe uh, for 36 uh, periods, uh, years in their case. So what do they do? So uh, first they construct kind of DI. DI is not directly observed in their, uh, in their okay. They need to somehow measure it first from the data. The way they measure it, they say, okay, let me, for every unit, compute the average number of periods where this uh, region received uh, the aid, right? So where the aid was uh, uh, was actually strictly positive. Yeah, strictly positive. Okay, so the average number uh, of periods. And so this is going to be DI. Then they're going to interact this DI with ZT and run to a source. Okay, so that's that's what they do. Now. Uh, here I'm plotting uh, the uh, uh, the uh, results for the uh, uh, first stage that you get that they get right. Uh, so kind of this is what this is what I'm plotting here uh, is essentially. So this is for the first stage. So I'm plotting here uh, this thing. Right, so the difference, or like in this case, it's not exactly a difference; it's a contrast, but it's an aggregate, aggregate uh, thing, uh, uh, which uh, varies over time. So, but for the endogenous variable, right? So that I'm plotting it here, right, uh, and on the in the in the black, right, and in the red is uh, what happens when you're trying to predict that series by ZT. Okay, so you're trying to predict it, and that's that's what you get. Okay, this is how your residuals from that prediction look like. Okay, uh, and uh, you might say, oh well, okay, they look like something. Uh, well, maybe there is some persistence. Uh, um, maybe it's not the greatest plot for residuals, but well, how do we know that it's uh, that it is uh, it is uh, a manifestation of anything? Well, uh, here is 
uh, a way to see that uh, this, is a, this can be a manifestation of uh, something. So what I'm doing here uh, is that I'm taking my uh, endogenous variable and I'm keeping the part that was predicted before. And I'm kind of, the only thing that I'm changing, I'm shifting the residuals, right? So I'm kind of permute them randomly over I. With the idea is that if there is something in these residuals that is that looks like, uh, like this theta uh, I H T, when I permute it randomly over I, this theta I is gonna be uncorrelated with anything, right? So kind of, I'm kind of, I'm gonna make things Kind of the, the, something like this difference will become zero. Okay, and so we, we can see if something like that actually happens or not. Okay, and what you can get is that indeed something like that happens uh, in a sense that once you once you permute things and you run uh, this uh, regressions and now look at the residuals, they are dramatically different. Okay, so uh, now these uh, residuals are much. So kind of, yeah, so this is the scale is the same. So in this case, uh, root mean squared error is more than two times smaller uh, for uh, that regression versus this regression. Okay, so we do not, uh, mm, uh, uh, do not kind of construct a formal test out of this, although I guess that can be possible. But uh, the, uh, the idea here is that empirically, you see that there is something aggregate in your residuals that, 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 that is there, right? Uh, when you run your regression, they are they are correlated with your uh, with your instrument, right? With uh, with the di times zt, but uh, there is still a lot of uh, aggregate or like factor structure, if you wish, in what's left. Okay, and uh, this factor structure is potentially problematic because it can be it can be correlated with uh, with uh, your aggregate shock and with your exposure to this shock, and so this. Uh, this would uh, kind of lead to inconsistencies. So that's that's in a nutshell what we're trying to do, and that's kind of this this is uh, this is the plot uh, that tells you that in practice and applications, presume yeah, kind of this is one uh, presumably that that actually kind of matters. And now uh, uh, at the high level, uh, what do you need for things to work, right? So for to be able to improve over this. So uh, what you need is to be able to construct this weights, right? That uh, balance this unobserved aggregate shocks. Uh, in other words, you need to be able to get something like this theta one tilde uh, approximately equal to theta zero tilde. And that is gonna be like an overlap condition. So that this is possible, okay? Uh, and uh, possible in a reasonably good way. Right, so that uh, you can average a reasonably large number of units and uh, and get to it. Okay, uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that, of course, HT cannot be perfectly correlated with ZT. Okay, so uh, in some sense, this is a version of the exclusion restriction because if uh, because HT uh, by assumption uh, might affect the outcomes directly. So if HT and ZT are the same, then ZT is not an instrument, right? Because because it is something that affects both uh, outcomes and the policy variable. Okay, so that's uh, that's another thing that you would need. Uh, and the third thing is that you need enough data to, to be able to actually uh, learn this from the, from, uh, from the data. So that, that's what's, what's gonna matter. Okay, uh, so, and that's what we do, right? So we propose an alternative to, to SLS that have the same structure. So you aggregate and then you regress over time. So the aggregate or cross-section regress over time. Uh, so what we argue is that this, uh, that our algorithm that, that, that has the structure will deliver meaningful policy parameters in a wide class of models, uh, even in the presence of unobserved aggregate shocks. Then I will show you a simulation uh, that's gonna be very tightly linked to the data where you will see that, uh, that this works, uh, just in that simulation um, and dominates to SLS, uh, even, in, even if, for, for, for different reasons, both for bias reasons and for uh, variance reasons. And uh, finally, if time permits, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the statistical properties of this uh, thing and what kind of inference uh, you can do. Yeah. Now, in the interest of time, let me skip, uh, skip literature and go directly to the algorithm. Okay, so here is, uh, here is uh, what, uh, what we do. 
Okay. Uh, they, uh, here is how the weights are going to be selected. Okay. So we're going to select weights by solving the following uh, optimization problem. Okay. So this is a, a quadratic uh, yeah, optimization convex problem, right? Uh, where you're minimizing a function uh, with respect to weights and oops, uh, and uh, additional kind of coefficients. Mm. But what does it have, right? So uh, it has two parts. Uh, so the first part is this, okay? The L2 uh, norm of the weights, okay? And the idea behind this part is very simple. It relates, it relates to this fact that I told you that we want our weights to be spread out, right? So that they, that they do not uh, that they do not pick up the noise too much, right? So that they average the noise. So this diffusion uh, of weights uh, will be enforced by this by this uh, part of the optimization problem. And the other two parts, they're related to this other idea that we want our weights to be such that on aggregate, it is easy to predict uh, uh, the aggregates with, with just ZT. And so that's exactly what happens here. So let's look at this one. So over here we have the average or the aggregate of the outcomes in every time period with the weights that we're considering. And well, uh, then we are trying to predict that aggregate over time. Uh, with uh, with uh, ZT, and uh, we are going to try to kind of to minimize this. We will try to pick up the weights that make this small, right? So that it's easier to to uh, to to predict. Okay. And what is Z zeta? Zeta. Uh, you mean this one or not zeta? Zeta. Uh, Z ah, here, here, here. Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, that is a, that's going to be a regularization parameter that will control how much uh, how much uh, weight we'll put on these two objectives. Okay, and then I'll, I'll talk in a second about that. Mm. Thank you. Yes, and then uh, so we're minimizing this uh, subject to a couple of constraints. Uh, so the explicit constraints are that we want our weights to aggregate uh, to be kind of. Uh, aggregate this di to one so we kind of that gives us the relevant scale what of the weights that we want and then they need to balance out the time uh, fixed effect so they uh, average to zero uh, as to as so as ways do and on top of that you might want to include some additional constraints in the main uh, kind of i'm going to focus on station one there are no additional constraints but in principle uh, you can in include additional convex constraints on this uh, on this weights uh, and that would typically not affect computational things uh, all that much, but might improve uh, statistical properties. Okay. And another th important thing is that you're uh, looking here at uh, periods from one to some T naught, okay? And T naught is a parameter that you choose. And we're gonna choose T naught basically equal to like third of the time periods. So the first third of time periods is gonna be used to learn the weights. Okay. So now about the zeta. Hi, Mitya. Sure. Question. Sure. Uh, so wh why weighting the two prediction errors with these variances? Oh, that just, uh, just to fix the scale. So that, uh, I mean, so it doesn't matter whether they're measuring things uh, in thousands or in, 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 in hundreds. Uh, that, that's, uh, that I understand, but, but the two things together. So it's like waiting one one. Scale. Ah, you mean like why why don't I why don't I like I don't have some 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 kind of uh, uh, structure that may that um, awaits them uh, reweights them so putting more on on one or the other one. Yeah, do do you have any intuition like what would be desirable? That's a, that's a good question. One one. Yeah, so we don't go in that in that uh, direction. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so at this point, I I am not sure. Okay, what would be the what would be the optimal thing to do? Okay. And can you please a little bit more explain about this spread out? Why do you use penalization at all? Well, uh, the idea uh, here is that. Uh, 
this is pretty aggressive, right? Uh, kind of minimizing these things, right? So uh, in principle, you can end up with weights that, uh, that concentrate on the few units, okay? Uh, so that you're picking up uh, the units that look like ZT and you're dropping everybody else. Okay? So that would be, uh, you might say, well, that's fine, but that's not necessarily fine because, mm, because then it's unclear whether what you observe in, in the data is this a, the effect of this unobserved uh, 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 aggregate shocks HT, or it is the uh, or it is the syncretic noise that you haven't aggregated. Okay? And uh, we kind of uh, need to deal with that. And to deal with that, we, uh, we want our weights to, uh, to be concentrated on a large number of units, uh, or uh, which is equivalent to saying that we want them uh, to have a relatively small L2 mod. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes, thank you. Okay. I mean, like you can think that the variance is proportional to the norm, right, of the weights. So if you aggregate your idiosyncratic errors, then the, the, the variance is going to be proportional to this norm. So you want this uh, variance to be small. Okay. Uh, all right. So what about the zeta? So if you get zeta equal to infinity, right? Uh, so here. So you're only minimizing the first thing. What you will get is the terse of a solution. Okay, so the two source solution doesn't care about these two other parts. Okay. Uh, it will just tell you what is the most spread out, what are the most spread out weights uh, uh, subject to constraints. That's, uh, that is what two source does. Uh, so if you're not picking zeta equal to infinity, then you are starting to, uh, 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 then you are starting to kind of uh, care about these things, right? And then the idea is that uh, well, what you're trying to enforce is something like this, right? So that uh, the aggregates kind of look like ZT uh, for the first you know, periods, periods. And the idea here is that if there is nothing in your, uh, in your in, there, is not, there are no this unobserved aggregate shocks, there is no theta i, everything is very nice, then uh, very simple ways should do that, right? So the point here is that if there is nothing to worry about in your data, then you will converge to the, then you are going to be close to the good solution, the Tesla solution. But if there is something to worry about, then you'll try to kind of correct for that. So there, there is going to be this, in some sense, uh, adaptivity, if you wish. So if, if the world is very good, then you're going to be uh, finding something that looks like Tesla. If the world is not very good, then you will kind of go further away from Tesla. Yeah. Yes, question? No? Okay. Let me, uh, uh, let me skip this and, and uh, just uh, tell you that uh, if we, uh, then we have the weights, right? So we solve that problem. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in a moment how, like, just two additional things about that. Uh, so then you say, okay, I have uh, the other, the rest of my time periods, the T naught plus one to T. And so on these things, I'm going to run the aggregate regressions and I'm going to take the ratio. Uh, and then um, under certain assumptions, we show that uh, you can take them the residuals from this uh, and uh, kind of estimate uh, the, uh, you need some, some version of the model for this, uh, for this ZT uh, thing here. Uh, yeah, so it should be Z. I'm not, I'm not ZT, but, okay, so uh, so they use need some version of the model time series model for ZT, uh, and then you can conduct inference. In particular, if your ZT is a simple object, uh, like I don't know, uh, maybe a trend plus a simple regressive process, then you can estimate that, uh, and uh, that would be input for the uh, variance uh, for the for the inference algorithm. Okay. Okay, uh, so that's that's how things work. Uh, in addition, uh, there are a couple of details. So two parameters uh, are important for this procedure: the penalization, uh, so rigorization thing, zeta, uh, and the, in some sense, also uh, kind of like rigorization. This uh, t naught, how much uh, you spare to learn the weights. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, our formal results tell us that you should kind of use of the same order uh, to learn the weights and then to learn your uh, to learn your um, to kind of estimate the regressions. So in practice, we just say let's pick a third of this uh, period to learn uh, the weights and. Uh, uh, zeta, we're gonna we're gonna set it on on the estimated noise level. So what in practice it means that we're gonna kind of take the um, take out first few princi principal components out of our uh, outcomes and uh, endogenous variable, and uh, kind of uh, use the rest to estimate the noise and set and set uh, the zeta at that level. So that's what we're Okay, uh, on top of this, if uh, ZT has strong trends, then uh, you can, and you're worried about that, you might say, well, this information and trends, I, I do not trust it for identification. Then you can easily kind of incorporate that in all of these regressions, and it's going to be uh, kind of trivial to, to do that. Uh, if you have time additional covariates, then time invariant covariates can be. Uh, uh and included in this set okay so you just kind of as another constraint on your weight so that uh, you aggregate uh units such that not only uh, this thing so that not only this is uh, uh aggregates to zero but like uh, this weights times some times some x's they also aggregate to zero okay. so uh, you say that if z have uh these have trends so yeah. you mean it can be even like stochastic trends or deterministic trends? And well, I, I, I'm, I'm focusing. I'm focusing on the deterministic trends. Okay, the stochastic trends. So uh, we're not going to allow Z to be super first. Like we're not going to uh, allow the unit root uh, for Z. Okay, uh, but uh, for example, if you think that uh, Z has uh, some polynomial trends, uh, then uh, you can include these trends here and here. And the reason why you might want to do that is because you might not trust the variation in trends uh, as a source of identification. So you might want to say, I don't trust that, that that's a good variation. Okay. Does that make sense? Maybe, yes. And also, kind of, can you use the, uh, the second part of your sample somehow to tune zeta or this so, so, so yeah, so that's a good question. So we don't do that. So we don't. Uh, so we just pick uh, the level uh, as I said. So we estimate and then just plug in. Uh, I mean, the, I guess the question is how much. Uh, I mean, in practice, would I expect people to to have enough time series data to 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 do a meaningful validation? I don't know. I mean, like we haven't we haven't. Uh, we haven't Try that. So, but then I, I guess you, you might you might think about how to do it. And, okay. Uh, and right. also, uh, do do you need? Uh, so, sorry, one more thing. So, for kind of consistency results, mm -hmm. you need zeta to to get very close to somehow to something or. No, no. For consistency results, this is, I mean, like what you need, like for consistency results, it's fine. I mean, like uh, for for good rate results, you need to pick zeta and in in the right way. Okay. So, but uh, for consistency results, you just need it to be. Are, I mean, not very large, essentially. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, uh, Ws are estimated. Yes. Uh, the noise is estimated, then the last stage is a function of estimated Ws. Yes. And so, Z Zetas are also yeah. fixed at some estimated level. And you're saying that there's still inference that can be based. Yeah, uh, the idea here is going to be this. Yeah, exactly. So the uh, here, what will matter is uh, how much persistence you allow for. Okay. So with, with the idea is that uh, if there is, uh, we're going to be very uh, uh, that far. But what you what you want uh, to get is that 
we are going to be very uh, my a uh, very restrictive, I would say, in the in the noise part, in the epsilon part. So we're going to assume that that's uh, essentially white noise. Okay, you might allow for some uh, for some um, outer correlation structure in there, but uh, kind of so as long as it's uh, as it's very kind of fast decay, then, then then you're fine. Right. But the idea, basically, the idea is that the part from the first part of the data, this T not uh, first T not periods, the question is how much you can condition on it, right? Without without uh, destroying things. And we are going to make assumptions that would allow us to condition without destroying things. Okay. So that's why you would be able to uh, get good results. Does that make sense? Well, the, yeah. Well, the, it has to be. It's, it's an important assumption on what uh, carry out, carries over from T0. Yeah, so they are Yeah, exactly. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah because, because deltas and pi's would be functions of, uh, so it's, it is a, an optimization. So the, 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 weights, the weights will be the function of, of the past, right? Yes, yes. Exactly, and as I said, we are gonna, Assume uh, that there is something that's fixed about the past, right? So, yeah, uh, so, yeah. so this is going to be a very fixed effect model. Okay, so there is going to be a lot of stuff that's fixed. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. But then there is another thing that has to do with uh, how the reduced form errors mm -hmm. correlate here, and how the uh, the reduced form errors correlate in the reduced form. So that in in in, the, in that optimization question earlier in, in the first step, mm -hmm. uh, in here, yes. So this is like regressing that aggregate yeah. on Zs, yeah. And so clearly, there's these are reduced forms that might have correlations over over, uh, over the errors. Oh, sure. What you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but again, this uh, because they're going to be idiosyncratic, right? So the fact that there is some correlation, like this, is going to be washed away, right? So what, what, what the only correlation that's going to matter is the aggregate one, right? Uh, the the one that comes from the aggregate, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and that uh, that is going to be fine. We actually kind of use that correlation. Okay, so we uh, we we are fine with that correlation. But uh, let, let me let me let me go ahead and I'll tell you what what works. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, I don't have that much time. So let me just briefly tell you the uh, the uh, assumptions. Okay, on the potential outcomes. So what I mean here by potential outcomes. So we're trying to estimate some uh, effects, like structural effects. So we need to make the assumptions on the uh, on the model, right, uh, of these things, and this is how we think about it. So uh, let me start with the endogenous variable first. So the endogenous variable is affected by two things: this H T here and Z T here. Okay. So Z T is the observed uh, aggregate shock; H T is unobserved aggregate shock. Okay? The uh, outcome is affected by the uh, policy variable, right? And also the unobserved aggregate shock. So that's how you should think about it. And uh, we are gonna assume a following kind of the intuition from most of the literature, um, sometimes not uh, very uh, explicitly articulated that uh, this aggregate shocks, ZT, HT, observed and unobserved ones, they are independent of, uh, of kind of like potential outcomes, right? Uh, what does it mean? They are dependent of all, this, uh, all these things, right? Random or not, but they are independent of all of that, right? So their the, the, the distribution doesn't depend on this. Okay. That's uh, one thing. And second, uh, for the um, this uh, this talk, I'm going to assume that DI uh, that we're going to use in our algorithm, it's almost like this pi i, right? So it is it is it is just linear form of this pi i. So. In practice, you don't need to be as as uh, as uh, restrictive, but that's you know, what I'm going to do. So this is in potential outcomes. 
and here is just a quick example of uh, where these structures can arise. So imagine that you are in the local equilibrium station where uh, you have, um, like, I don't know, demand supply type of thing, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so it, this, it is, so you have, a, I don't know, demand shock, supply shock, right? They are potentially uh, correlated aggregate shocks. Uh, and then again, kind of with once you solve this system, right, you get this one essentially. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, an example, very recent example, this is paper in Restart that has this, uh, where why it is the change in retail employment and W H is a change in local housing prices. Okay, so the idea is that those two things they kind of are. Uh, um, are determined in the equilibrium at the local level, and then there is a change in national housing prices that kind of affects affects both of this. And so this is ZT. Uh, okay, so this is a, an example. Now, uh, statistical assumptions uh, that we're going to do are going to be about uh, these things uh, alpha it. Okay, uh, this and this. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to say that you can decompose them into two, uh, into three components. So the first component is going to be the two-way fixed effects, right? That's fine. The last component are going to be uh, is going to be white noise essentially. Okay, so going back to the correlation question uh, in our analysis right now, we're assuming that this is just white noise. Okay, so this is uh, uh, independent over time. You can allow these things to be correlated over time, but not very strong. Uh, so that's the second thing. And the third thing uh, that kind of allows us, in some sense, to make this last assumption uh, is this uh, additional, like, if you wish, interactive fixed effects, this LITY and LITW. So these are going to be, uh, you can think of them as uh, if you collect them into matrix. N t time, n times t matrix, then uh, you can think that this is a matrix with a well-behaved spectrum, meaning that it has few uh, relatively large uh, single values, and then they decay relatively quickly. So we do not require it to be uh, of a fixed rank, like rank five. Uh, neither we require that it's kind of a very dramatic decay, but we do require that it the kind of the singular uh, that the spectrum behaves well. Okay. So that's what we're seeing. And so we will treat all of these things as fixed, right? Again, going back to what can propagate from the, uh, the periods, this, this is going to be fixed, right? So it's not stochastic. Okay, so uh, in this alpha, this is the only thing that's stochastic. Now, uh, what about the uh, other thing that is uh, random, right? ZT and HT. So here I'm assuming a very a simple model for uh, ZT and HT. Okay, uh, so there are there are going to be no trends. If you wish, you can include them uh, as long as they are belong to a known class. Uh, so there is going to be just intercepts, and then there are going to be shocks, right? And these shocks are going to be governed uh, through the uh, like linear processes. Okay, so these shocks are going to be governed uh, through this uh, by this uh, new shocks right and uh, with uh, with this kind of iterators so this is going to be a triangular matrix so you should think that this is kind of uh, a linear process where today depends on the shocks from the past right uh, we do not necessarily for kind of some of the results we don't need to uh, be very specific about this uh, so it might be uh, it, might, it, might, it doesn't have to be stationary, right? So you know, it's, it has to satisfy certain properties. So basically, you cannot have uh, you cannot have a lot of um, you cannot have um, very persistent processes, right? So uh, that's one. And second is that you need to have enough independence, right? And so which means that there is no one direction uh, which domin uh, which is the same as uh, that, that is very correlated. In other words, we're going to assume that the operator norm of this thing is much smaller than its previous norm. So that, that is the assumption. And this uh, uh, underlying shocks that drive this ones, they are going to be independent of some Gaussian shocks. Okay, so that's, that's what we're saying. So the going uh, to the question, what propagates? 
this this is how things propagate right from the past but because this this is a well behaved operator uh, that is going to be uh, fine okay because basically kind of it's going to decay uh, very very fast okay. the effect of the of the past okay. so this is the assumption now uh, uh, I don't have uh, much time to talk about this, but we do restrict the complexity of these matrices. As I said, this interactive fixed effect, uh, and uh, we kind of require them to be relatively kind of the spectrum of them to be relatively well behaved. And uh, the final thing is we assume that there exist WIs, the kind of ideal weights. Uh, that that balance these things. So this is the the lab assumption. So we assume that it is possible to kind of uh, find the weights that are strongly correlated with uh, pi i, right? So not just random weights. Like it's always possible to uh, balance something with just random weights. But no, kind of, there are weights that are correlated with pi i that are that are um, uh, that are balancing these things out. In other kind of more uh, I don't know, geometric way of thinking about it, if you were to take pi i and, and span it on the column span of the uh, column span of these things, then then there is something that's left. Okay, so there is something in the way your shock affects the uh, uh, the uh, outcomes that is not captured by by these things. That's what what is needed. So related to that, yes. the yeah. last thing sure. may be related to that. So if you have some level of heterogeneity in the effect and the treatment in tau i, I yeah. So, and that's so what would happen if you wait things you what do you, what happens like you kill yeah. heterogeneity or so the so the idea uh, that's a good question. So to what extent you can uh, you can uh, get a meaningful interpretation with to uh, be non-constant, okay? So uh, I guess the first response is that this is, this is the kind of fundamental uh, IV question, right? So this is the, like the same will happen if you have the, um, if you just use personal S weight. So it's kind of, it's not a question uh, about our strategy, but rather kind of just personal S strategy in general. Uh, and uh, so we, we discussed that, we provide some kind of assumptions under which you can get a meaningful uh, interpretation. To what extent in practice, uh, but of course it, it is possible it is, as, it, as it is always in this model, so it is always possible to come up with example where uh, you're going to get something that's not uh, necessarily meaningful if there is a, a very specific heterogeneity in treatment effects. Okay. Uh, again, uh, that is not about uh, our way of aggregating things, but rather about the uh, aggreg aggregation itself. Okay. So yeah, yes, I agree. So some like simple results and the very restrictive. Yeah, yeah, models. sure, sure. Yeah, so what, we, what... Know, yeah. So 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 we know like two step uh, least squares will be what waiting by. Variances and uh, like no, no, like, uh, yeah. So you, you'll you'll get like for two stage the squares you'll get like a local average treatment effect representation or uh, uh, sometimes, uh, right? But that does not necessarily happen in this model, okay? Because all those results are uh, in models where uh, they are not in the fixed effects models. So they're they're in the like yeah, more or less like st more of a standard regression model. So in the fixed effects models. They actually do not necessarily hold. Okay. And uh, right. So, so I'm specifically my question maybe. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase last time. So be, because you do this reweighting, yeah. uh, you you choose you optimize over weights. Yeah. So I guess this is a really interesting piece in your your paper. And then yes. I'm interested how these uh, data driven weights. Uh, changes our thinking about this. Uh, ah, yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, yeah. I, like, let me, let me, let me answer this way. So, if you have additional structure on this thing, right? Uh, say you assume that it has additional properties, right? Then you can potentially uh, include, kind of deal with that by include by by including some of these properties in this in this set, right? So you kind of saying, okay, I know. That my weights 
kind of for, for me kind of they, they have to be something right uh, because of my treatment effects are heterogeneous for example like if the eye is binary you might say okay I want my weights to be non-negative for the uh, for the uh, for the particular, uh, for the particular, for the DIs that I go to say one, right? And in that case, uh, in that case, that might might help. You, okay, so then you might get a reasonably kind of well-behaved interpretation for the uh, when you when you get uh, the aggregate uh, quantity. Okay, so the bottom line here is that. Uh, that uh, within our framework, if you have that additional information, you might be able to incorporate it. Okay? And we discuss it a bit, but do not directly go there because we kind of think that this is a question of the, that is uh, uh, fundamental to, to us as a, as a strategy rather than a particular instance, which is our version, right? So that's, that's, that's how we think about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all right, so quickly, uh, because uh, uh, I have like this 10 minutes. So we want to understand uh, how our thing works against to SLS in, uh, in some realistic simulations. Okay, so it's always easy to pick up a simulation that will make our thing very superior, so we don't want to do that. Uh, so what we want to do is to calibrate to a particular data set and where we can see to what extent the different uh, aspects of the of our model are relevant right in the sense that uh, of course if i make like this uh, this matrix is very large and then, then this can be a problem for the method that doesn't care about them like the usual to so us like just with big twigs but in practice we would expect that many out main a huge part of the variation is captured by say the test two wave extent so uh, that's what we are trying to do, okay? So what do we do? We will estimate this LITs on the data, we'll estimate pi i's on the data, and then we will uh, estimate the process for ZT on the data, okay? And then uh, HT and the exposures to the, this HT are not gonna be directly observable, so they will make ad hoc chases and we'll try to make, not to be not that aggressive about that. Okay, so where do we get the data? So we take the data from this um, example in macro. This is Nakamura and Steinson, where they look at uh, United States and try to estimate local fiscal multipliers something I discussed at the beginning. So they have a, a design where you have just 51 uh, units. Uh, so these are uh, states uh, plus this DC. Uh, and then, uh, and then you have 39 time periods. Uh, they construct exposures. So this DI objects, that's how do they get them? So they estimate uh, for every unit, they estimate this regression. Okay, so this is unit level regression uh, with individual level uh, slopes. And so they get the slopes and call them DIs. Okay, so they are, that's what they're doing. And in their model, uh, so what can be a potential HT? Well, it's very easy to come up with potential HT. So again, ZT is the net is national military spending in the in the paper, right? So this can this is like something like HT can be political and business cycle, right? Aggregate stuff that correlates with military spending, uh, ta taxes, which are of course correlated with spendings, and in general, general equilibrium stuff that uh, that. Uh, policy response, okay, and uh, that is related to this uh, variables, like monetary policy. Okay, so, and for DI, the way you construct it, there is no way, there is no reason for it to be uncorrelated with theta i, right, kind of, why? Well, because if something like HT affects WIT and is correlated with ZT, by running this regression, you're going to construct something that's correlated with theta i. Okay, so just by doing this, you're gonna, you're gonna get exposure to, to that object. Okay, so that's that's what they do. So what do we do? So we do the same thing and we treat that as if it's right, right? So we're gonna estimate this model at the unit level and we take this pi i's and we say, these are the two pi i's. Okay, so they are the correct ones, okay? That they are gonna be driving things in our model. Then we uh, take uh, residuals, this UIT residuals, and the same for the um, uh, for the uh, uh, outcomes. 
right? Uh, and uh, we on the what's 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 left, we estimate the uh, we kind of so we get the so we visualize things and we say okay, how much of the factor structure is left in the residuals? So if there is going to be something left, we're going to take that out by by kind of the first I guess ten or eleven. Uh, principal components, so which is pretty rich, right? So we have, uh, remember, uh, 50 units and uh, essentially 39 time periods. So this is a lot. So the huge part of the spectrum. So we're taking that out and we're fixing that. And then uh, we take the rest to estimate the noise. Okay. Uh, and so this is what's going to be fixed. Then the noise is going to be uh, just normal noise with the uh, a size that uh, comes from here. And then for ZT, we just take ZT, uh, we put it into a uh, standard R package that automatically kind of estimates an ARIMA model for it. Okay. And then get this case, it was, uh, I think, our model with it. So, uh, one. Okay, so that's what we do. Uh, and then we simulate from, uh, from this model. Uh, and, uh, but as this is just DT, right, and, and the stuff is related to ZT, how do we get uh, HT that we don't observe? Well, we kind of constructed in a way that's correlated with ZT and similar in size, so that it is the HT vector is not larger than our ZT, it's the same of the same size. And uh, the same we do for the exposures to this HT, we kind of make it correlated with pi i, uh, and make kind of but controlling the size so that it's kind of not a very large thing okay, compared to compared to this object. And so then we simulate it. Uh, and so let me uh, just show you the table. Okay. So there are four designs in this table, uh, and they range from simple to complicated. So the simple, the very first one, is where there is nothing wrong. Okay, uh, what does it mean? There is not, no, there is no, uh, there are no, there is no matrix, matrices L, right? So there are no interactive fixed effects. There is no HT. Everything is very nice and very good for 2SOS. And so it's not surprising that uh, 2SOS dominates our, our uh, method, right? This is in terms of both are unbiased, essentially. And in terms of RMSC, um, we are we are losing to, to SLS. This is not surprising because we're more aggressive to the data, right? Uh, but at the same time, yeah, there is some loss, but it's not that large, actually, uh, uh, the loss in this case in RMC. Okay. Now, uh, oops. Uh, now, the second design, what happens is that we bring in the uh, unit, this, this more general fixed effect, right? This L matrix. Uh, and then, uh, but this L matrix is they're just fixed, right? So uh, for the, um, they're going not, not going to be a problem per se for the source, right? Uh, or, or for us, right? There is still no HT. So in this regime, both estimators are still uh, unbiased, essentially. Uh, but we suddenly start to win a lot in terms of RMSA, right? So first RMSA increases. Quite dramatically, and then kind of we, but we're able to mitigate part of this increase. Okay, and the reason is that our method kind of takes takes that 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 additional uh, stuff that we bring in by this interactive fixed effects into account. So kind of balancing also this interactive fixed effects. Not all of them, because it's impossible to balance all of them. They're very rich, right? So this is like rank eleven structure, uh, but some of them. Now, uh, what happens if you add, if you kind of forget for a moment about this L uh, and you add HT? So in this regime, uh, what happens is that uh, we uh, uh, remain approximately unbiased, at least we're in the various dominant regime. Whereas, uh, of course, to SLS is is quite biased. The ordinary to SLS. And is in the bias dominant regime. I said, oh, I mean, like bias, bias variance dominant regime in this case. Uh, so it is more or less the, the same order, the bias and the variance. And then, uh, whereas we win in RMSC, uh, mostly because of the bias, but also partly. Yeah, mm. yeah in this case, of course, mostly because of the bias. Uh, and then finally, you have both, 
right? And then, yeah, uh, to us, so as we win both uh, because of this effect and because of this effect. Okay. So we remain biased, approximately unbiased, and win in terms of urgency. So the message to this uh, about from this paper in one picture is uh, uh, is this is this picture. Okay, so this is distribution in our simulation uh, of uh, the errors, right? To, to tau hat minus to uh, minus tau uh, for the robust estimate, our estimate, and the standard to So on the left, so this is for design number uh, two and design number four, right? So on the left, there are no unobserved shocks. But there is this additional uh, structure that is present in the data, right? So this left thing here is a simulation that we do not tweak essentially at all, in the sense that there is nothing that that's ad hoc, right? So we just take the data, we pass it through the algorithm, fixed algorithm that I told you, and then we simulate from the resulting model, and uh, you compare and we compare it to so as to to our estimate. And uh, what you can see is that there are sizable gains in efficiency, right? Even without this uh, unobserved aggregate shocks. Now, if there are unobserved aggregate shocks, then, then this gains in efficiency, they stay, but you also get uh, gains in bias. So they might not look uh, as dramatic in this case, but a kind of for inference that actually will be important. And of course, kind of this is just us. Uh, I, I could have made this much more dramatic if I want, right? So I just kept the scale of age uh, at a fixed level so that uh, yeah, I can move this basically. Uh, okay. So how can you be sure that this is not a overfit? Like this increase, this is really great pictures uh, when you- Well, what do you mean? What do mean? Like this, this, this is, uh, this is uh, what do you mean by So this is the difference uh, in tau hat minus tau, right? So this is the distribution of our estimate, right? So it's unbiased. Uh, and uh, it has a reasonably good variance compared to compared to the OLS time, right? So if we were over yeah, but, but then, if we were mm -hmm. then we would have be biased, right? Uh, kind of biased out of sample, or sure, but this is out of sample. This is out of sample, right? essentially. In a sense, yeah, that's that what. Because this is not where I'm estimating. So this is, again, this is for the procedure. Remember, the procedure estimates the weights on the first third periods then runs on the rest, right? So and this is the distribution of uh, our errors uh, in that case. Okay, so that is, and, and again, the motivation, the reason behind it, it's not, it's not something kind of, or, you know, uh, something very complicated, or, or I would say it's very surprising. The reason is uh, that uh, there is in the data, there is part that is systematic and uh, present, right? This unobserved, uh, this interactive fixed effects, there are in the data. And so by not doing anything about them, you just pushing them to the variance. And you might say, well, uh, that might be part of it is bias, but okay, let's assume that all of it is variance. Uh, so you are pushing it to the variance, and then your variances get large. Okay, so what we are saying here is, well, you can actually deal with that uh, by by doing doing our thing, right? Uh, kind of, I don't know, uh, like JLS type of logic. Okay, all right. So I'm uh, I'm out of time. So let me just in one slide tell you the uh, results. Uh, statistical results. So what we get is that in this regime, right, where uh, n is of the order of the t, uh, t naught is of the order of the t. So which is by t naught, remember, is the part of the data that we are learning, where we are learning the weights. So we select the third. So this is satisfied. This is kind of such as uh, natural in our examples, so where uh, it's either n more or less the same as t, or maybe like three times larger. So that one we show is that uh, under no additional restrictions, well, under some 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 of this assumption that I made, and uh, uh, you get uh, asymptotic, you get normality, right? Uh, so this is a standard normal vector, but you get asymptotic bias. Right uh, of the order of square root of t. So you converge at this rate and you get a synthetic bias. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, why is it happening? 
the answer is that it's happening because of this idiosyncratic errors, right? So kind of because if you you kind of you kind of there is some some overfitting, right? So there is some overfitting because of that uh, in our procedure, and that manifests as, as this as this asymptotic bias. Now, if the variance of this measurement errors is small enough, and in particular in the regime where it kind of goes to zero. Uh, then, then you don't get a bias. Okay. So in practice, the the whether you have a large bias or not will kind of depend on how much of your outcomes is captured by the persistent by by the fixed stuff, right? By the stuff that you can kind of condition on uh, compared to this additional errors, right? And so if the part that comes from errors is small, uh, then you don't uh, you don't get bias. Okay. And then what we show is that. Uh, the variance of this vector can be consistently estimated as long as we can estimate the process for ZT, right? So like if I can estimate consistently the process for ZT, then I can estimate the variance uh, for this uh, thing. It's going to be kind of like if it was design based thing, right? Because uh, you, the, the only thing that's random in your aggregate regression is this ZT. So once you know the process for ZT, uh, you're kind of good to, to go, and uh, so you can construct uh, under some Rubin type of procedures uh, using that, and, and we can do robust inference. Okay, so let me uh, just conclude. So, what do we do in this work? We propose a new algorithm uh, for uh, quality simulation with the aggregate shocks. So, the algorithm has two parts uh, uh, aggregation and time series regression. Uh, we show that it dominates the SOAS in uh, realistic simulations and under uh, uh, technical conditions, additional conditions, we get asymptotic normality and we, if the noise level is uh, low enough, uh, we can conduct inference. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for running over time. Hey, Dimitri, may I just ask a question? Sure. Hi, Martin. Hi, nice to see you again. Uh, really nice talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, just a very general question. So sure. are you here a parametric model, right? And could you also extend this to more non-parametric or flexible models? Uh, I mean, then so there is the issue. Or so you mean parametric uh, meaning linear or uh, parametric? Uh, so what we yeah, are also in terms of effect heterogeneity, for example, if you think the uh, diff and diff case, right? And mm -hmm. this is which you probably know by uh, Xavier Dotfoy and uh, mm -hmm. sure Maud de Chais Martin, right? And then uh, they show that if you have uh, such a model where you can have effect heterogeneity, then um, actually. Things become more complicated, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. let me let me let me briefly uh, talk about that. So uh, this uh, results on the heterogeneity and I don't know like failure of two so of two two way fixed effects estimators. I guess right. That's 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 uh, what you're referring to, right? Then uh, so this is all of that is possible in OLS version. Okay, so for OLS, you kind of can deal with this. Okay, in the 2SLS regime, I'm not aware of anything uh, that uh, that uh, that explicitly uh, deals with. So there is there was some work by uh, the guy who was on the market this year, uh, but I think it was more like you know uh, bad things happen. Okay, and uh, and, uh, and there is no real remedy. Okay. Uh, what we are trying to do, in, as I was discussing with Igor, uh, right? So to say, well, if there is some heterogeneity in this object that is well behaved, then you can try and take into account it uh, when you construct the weights. Uh, now, the conventional results on this heterogeneity, on kind of on how you circumvent this heterogeneity problem in the uh, in the IV estimation is like local average treatment effects, but those results. Uh, would not hold in the in the fixed effects models, unfortunately, uh, in general. So you cannot get that interpretation. Uh, so the what we in I guess in the future what we can try to do is to try to maybe go a little bit away from the this uh, really fixed effects model and say okay what if we assume some 
uh, distribution of these things, right? Uh, so we're going to go to the random effects model. Uh, and in that model, perhaps you can say something uh, more positive, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's not what we're trying to do. So, yeah, but uh, then of course, uh, all of those issues that are present in the usual um, uh, to a fixed effects regressions, they, they can only be exacerbated uh, in, in, this, uh, in this world, right? Uh, this being said, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, for many uh, applications, um, I, mean, I guess uh, researchers are more or less fine with this assumption. So this at this point, of course, you can say that okay, they were fine with, uh, with this assumption for different diff five years ago, and now they are not. Yeah, I don't know. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this clarification. Yeah. All right, any other questions? So well, to clarify more on kind of intuition of what's going on. So what would happen if I put zero weight in the optimization on the fit for Ys? So I will do- Oh, you would get two SLS. Two, so I will fit just the instruments by choosing weights. Yeah, yeah, so kind of the weights, will, the weights will be the same as the two SLS weights. So if you, ah, you are. Or you mean like uh, wait here? I, I thought that. So what do you mean? So I thought that what you meant yes. is that if I drop this and this. So if you drop the second term here on uh, just this the slide, second, just this one. Yeah. If you drop this, so yes. you feed the uh, yeah. yeah. If I feed this, then uh, I might not. So that that might not work, right? Potentially, right? Because uh, there, there might be still HT in YIT, right? That is not present in WIT. So imagine that there is an uh, aggregate shock that affects the outcomes, right? Uh, but doesn't necessarily affect the, uh, the treatment variable. So, but, so you're, you're going to be kind of, you, you will still have an invalid instrument, but, uh, but. Uh, why, why the instrument is invalid in this case? So you have well, aggregate well, yeah, in the because, outcome, but. Yeah, because but I mean, it's orthogonal like, to instrument. No, it's not orthogonal. So HT will be not, it's not, doesn't, it's not orthogonal, right? So like, uh, so imagine this is your model for the, uh, for the reduced form. And this HT comes from just the outcome equation. Right, so in the uh, so in the uh, in the first stage there is no HT. Then you are still there. There is still a problem, right? Because basically your ZT is still correlated with this HT. That makes sense. Yeah, trying to digest. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So, but but because of this explanation, so maybe. Uh, by uh, making a tuning parameter on one of these brackets, because you, you, you exactly, you don't know uh, what is more important, which part to to fit to fit wise outcomes or to fit. Oh, values. sure, 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 sure. I mean, at this point, we don't have a prior. Which one is more important? Yeah, I mean, as I as I said, this is this is an interesting question, but. I, I, I have nothing to say about that at this point, so I need to think. Uh, but uh, you are right in principle that this additional degree of uh, flexibility, right? So which part of, of this uh, you think you should fit, right? And uh, I guess my prior would be first to fit this part. Uh, more than that. The other one, but I don't know. I mean, like both are both are relevant, right? The question is what you want, right? If you are fine with something like intention to treat effects, then 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 that's what you need to do. But if you want to get both the the like the treatment effect, then you kind of need to make sure that both are present. So I have I don't I don't I don't know. So I, maybe there is some efficiency gain that I, I, I don't see at this point, but. It feels that both should be uh, uh, similarly important to this optimization. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Well, I don't know.
questions, let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for thank the you interesting me. talk. We can stop recording. Uh, Dimitri, I want uh, to ask about if something can be said about the properties of the distributions that you had. Uh, you mean the properties uh... on the diagram? Ah, of those of those distributions. So, well, I mean, as I, as I was arguing, like in that, I think in the simulate. You mean in the simulation, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So in the simulation, uh, uh, I think we uh, kind of we are well approximated by this regime. Uh, you know, I was still live on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> uh, so. Um, uh, we are uh, well. Up, uh, so I think uh, uh, the simulation is well approximated by regime where the noise level is low. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in that regime, I would expect things to be kind of normal. Uh, but I haven't fit uh, the normal. I don't know, like the the normal distribution to that. So I don't know how far away actually that is from normal. So uh, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, you have any other question? Martin had a question. Oh, yes. No, Martin is out. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Dimitri, thank for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Great questions. Uh, yeah, thank you.